The following program is produced by the Living Church of God. This world has been absolutely deceived. A false Christianity has been palmed off on unsuspecting millions of people, my friends. This false Christianity is totally different, totally different from that of Christ and the original apostles. Do you want to know what true Christianity is all about? Do you want to know how to become a real Christian? Stay tuned. Tomorrow's World The Living Church of God presents Dr. Roderick C. Meredith Richard Ames Bringing you the good news of your future in Tomorrow's World this week, Dr. Roderick C. Meredith reveals how to become a true Christian. Now, Dr. Roderick C. Meredith. Again, my friends, you need to know what true Christianity is all about. The end of this present age is approaching. Traumatic times are just ahead of us. You need to learn and to act on the real truth of Almighty God. You need to become a true Christian. Notice this warning from the Apostle Paul regarding what was about to happen as he came to the end of his life. Go get your Bible. Follow me. Check up on me. Don't believe me. You believe what you read in the pages of your Bible. I want you to get that. Turn and check up on me as we go along. Turn to Paul's inspired warning in 2 Corinthians. I'm turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and beginning here in verse 4. If he who comes preaches another Jesus, Paul said, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. We've got to learn to get our religion out of the Bible, not out of human tradition, not out of the imaginations of men. And Paul was telling people another Jesus was going to be preached. Another Jesus was going to come along. Now let's turn back to 2 Corinthians, this time chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm going to begin reading here in verse 3. Paul wrote, But even if our gospel is veiled, in other words, our gospel is hidden in some way, it is veiled to those who are perishing. They're not dead yet, but they're perishing. They're cut off from God. They're blinded. Whose minds the God of this age, not the great God of all ages, but the God of this age, Satan the devil, has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So they are blinded. And we need to realize how this whole world is blinded. Notice Revelation chapter 12 now. Revelation chapter 12 and beginning in verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. That's the big statement there. The whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. In this deceived world, you don't just grow up to become a Christian. You don't just join a church and automatically become a true Christian. No way. And yet many people believe that. They think that you just sort of grow up and become a Christian and not ever have any big change, any direct calling from God or something where they're knocked down, they're changed, they're shaken, and where they give their life and a tremendous emotional moment and a real moment to the God that gives them life and breath. But notice what God tells us. God's Word tells us back here in John chapter 6. Turn with me to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 6 and beginning in verse 44. Here Jesus Christ said, No one can come to me. They can't come. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. You see, he's saying unless God calls you, you can't come to God. You don't automatically just grow up and become a Christian. You don't. And yet that false teaching has been circulated and believed all around the world today. Notice verse 65. He said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me. In other words, to become a Christian. You can't come to Christ unless it has been granted to him by my Father. And, of course, from right then, many of his disciples turned back and didn't go with him anymore. He wasn't calling everyone at that time, and he's not calling everyone today. 
Very few understand this need to be called by God. They think you just automatically just kind of drift into Christianity or grow up in the traditions of your fathers, and that makes you a Christian. Most people, the vast majority of people that I've ever known to be true Christians, have to be shaken up. They have to be knocked down in some way before they're willing to truly surrender to the Jesus Christ of the Bible. They have to come to that point, and God is calling them. God is dealing with them. God is opening their minds. Notice Luke chapter 14, if you would. Turn in the New Testament here to the Gospel of Luke, and I'm turning to chapter 14 and verse 25. And great multitudes went with him, with Christ, and Christ turned and said to them, now verse 26, Luke 14, If anyone comes to me, Jesus said, and does not hate, and here's the comparative term, as the Greek scholars all acknowledge, it means to love less by comparison. Of course, you know the rest of the New Testament tells you not to hate anyone. But if anyone comes to me and does not love less his father, his mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You've got to come to the place that you love Jesus Christ and you love the great God, the Father of Jesus Christ, far more than you love anything or anyone on this earth. Again, have you come to that place? Very few have. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You can't be a true Christian, Jesus is saying, unless you do that. Have you come to that absolutely total surrender of your heart, your mind, your life, your will to the God who gives you life and breath through Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, your boss, your master? Again, very few people have done that. For which of you, intending to build a tower, you're trying to build a skyscraper in modern terminology, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Do you have enough? Do you have a big enough company? Do you have the resources, the expertise, the huge bank loans, and all the rest of it, the permits from the government? Are you going to be able to do this? Are you going to be able to follow it through? Lest after he's laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. He, this man, George, he started out to become a Christian, but it was hard. He just gave up and quit. Think about that. Don't let that happen to you. You've got to make an absolute total surrender, a covenant with your Creator to give your life to God and mean it and follow through on it. That's what a true Christian is. Or, which, or what king going to make war against another king, Jesus continued, does not sit down first and consider whether he's able to meet with 10,000, him who, who comes against him with 20,000. How can you go out to war when your enemy outnumbers you two to one? How? Because you have that absolute commitment and because you have that living faith in God to know that He, through the power of His Spirit, will make up the difference and help you overcome yourself, help you overcome the world, help you overcome Satan the devil. That's how you're going to be able to do it. Or else while the other is still a way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. You'll want to make peace with the devil you want to compromise and say, well, it's not, you know, true Christianity is too hard. I'll just go along with the world. And yet that would get you into the coming great tribulation, my friends. That would get you ultimately in the lake of fire, unless that attitude is repented of somewhere down the line. So likewise, Jesus continued, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. You see, you have to at some point in your life forsake all that you have. You're willing to give your heart, your mind, your life, your will, your being to God and say, God, I'm giving my life to you and I mean it. I'm repenting. I'm turning away from my wrong ways. I'm giving my life to you through Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. I appreciate what you've done for me. I worship you. I adore you. I will obey you. I will do what you say. Because as you remember, Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? I've quoted that to you many, many times on this program. Luke 6, 46. Going back here now to Luke 14. Salt is good. Yes, salt gives food that tang, that zest. But if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? You see, God doesn't want Christians that have no salt in themselves. God doesn't want so-called Christians who have no zest 
no zeal, no passion to really want to get into God's kingdom, to want to obey God and fulfill His purpose. He doesn't want people like that, lukewarm people. It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill. Not even good for the manure pile, Jesus said. But men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So we've got to think about that. We've got to deeply meditate on the fact that a true Christian is one who makes a total commitment of his entire being to God, to live by every word of God, to let Jesus Christ live within him, as I'm going to show you. At this point, my friends, I urge you to write or call today for a very helpful, a very informative booklet which will help you think through what you should do about all of this and all the things you're hearing on this program. This booklet is entitled, Should You Be Baptized? It will be sent absolutely free upon your request. This booklet goes above and beyond what I have time to give you on this program. You need this booklet entitled, Should You Be Baptized? So call or write today and ask for your free copy. This booklet will be sent absolutely free. Ask for your free copy of this extremely important booklet on baptism. This informative booklet is yours absolutely free. No cost, no obligation. If you call this toll-free number, 1-800-934-5579. That's 1-800-934-5579. Or send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 501304. San Diego, California, 92150. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. No cost, no obligation to you. Call today. Now back to our topic, how to become a true Christian. We were in Luke chapter 14, for those of you who've turned in late. Luke chapter 14 and beginning in verse 33, Jesus is telling what true Christianity is all about. Notice here verse 33, So likewise, whoever if he be of you who does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. You've got to forsake everything. As he said earlier in this passage, you've got to love God more than you love your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters, everything. God has to come totally first. And yet God is not even real to most people at all. But God has to come first. He has to reveal himself to you. He has to call you. In many cases, he has to knock you down. But through this program, through events that are going to be happening, God is going to be opening the minds and hearts of thousands of you out there. And you need to heed that call. You need to understand. You've got to be willing to make a total commitment to the God, the God that gives you life and breath. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. God wants us to be totally turned on. He wants us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. He does not want us to be half-hearted Christians. No way. Let's go back to Mark chapter 1 now and notice more about this whole thing of becoming a true Christian. Mark. Chapter 1 in your Bible, beginning in verse 14. Here's the beginning of Christ's gospel. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He preached about the coming government of God. And as I've explained so often, the government of God, is a, the kingdom, is a literal government here on this earth under Jesus Christ. Christ will be ruling. The twelve apostles will be each over one of the twelve nations of Israel. And there will be a literal government from Jerusalem, over the whole earth. It's going to happen right here. This is real stuff, folks. Think about it. This is going to happen. So Jesus talked about the coming kingdom of God, the government of God, which will bring peace and joy finally to this earth. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That's what Christ tells us to do. Repent and believe the gospel. You've got to repent, first of all, and Christ always said that first, and all of God's servants did, as you perhaps have known if you read the Bible. Repent means not only to be sorry, like the drunk man is sorry after his booze, uh, binge on Saturday night, his binge with booze, you know. He's not just sorry temporarily. A really repentant person is so sorry, they think it through, they make a commitment to turn around and go the other way. 
That's what repentance is, a genuine, total change. And that's what each one of us has to do to become a Christian. Repent and believe. Believe the gospel. Believe that Christ is alive. Believe He's sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. Believe He's coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's going to set up a government here on this earth. That government based on God's laws where the whole world will learn to keep and obey the Ten Commandments and walk with God and there will be peace and joy, prosperity, everything good. Believe what Christ said. He didn't just say, believe on me all the time. He talked about the coming kingdom of God. So that's what men and women have got to come to do to understand that kingdom and to understand that true gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. Then we find back here in Acts chapter 2 and beginning in verse 36. He said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He was the Lord who was supposed to come. He was the anointed one, the Christ who was to come. And when they heard it, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Here's what we should do to be a real Christian. Here's what God led Peter to tell the people what to do to be a real Christian. Then Peter said to them, Repent. That's the first word each time. Repent. Turn around. Have this deep commitment to obey God. Have this total change where you totally give your life, your heart, your entire being to God in a way you have never done. Repent and, be, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You're baptized for the remission of sins. So you have to repent of sin. But you're baptized in the name of Christ. You accept Christ as your Savior. But my friends, you also need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord, as I've explained so many times. The one you obey. Your Savior, your Lord and Master, your High Priest. He's our merciful and faithful High Priest at God's right hand. And our coming King. Knowing He's going to come back as King of kings and Lord of lords. We accept the totality of Christ and what He is and what He did and what He's going to do. Not just the fact He died on the cross. Some people stress that and that's all they seem to know. And they forget all about Christ being our boss, our Lord, the word to obey, and they don't obey Him, most of these folks. To repent and be baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then God promises you the gift of the precious Holy Spirit, the very nature and character of God, where God Almighty put some of His precious nature, His very love and joy and peace and wisdom and power inside of you. Repent. Repent of sin? What is sin? Most people don't even get that fully today. They think that sin is uh, maybe smoking cigarettes or it's uh, drinking a glass of wine or going to a movie or something. And some of those things can be sin, of course, if they damage the body or if you get drunk and hurt others or whatever. But all the real definition of sin is found in a number of places, but the clearest one is back in 1 John. Turn there with me, if you would, the first epistle of John near the end of your New Testament. 1 John 3 and verse 4. It says here, sin is the transgression of the law. That's what sin is. It is breaking God's law, the Ten Commandments. Sin is having another God before you in place of the true God. Frankly, that's the biggest problem of all, and most people don't think that's of any importance. But once you get cut off from the true God, everything else falls away. You're not to have any idol, anything that looks like God or you think is God. You're not to take God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Those all tell you how to love God. Then he tells you, thou shalt not, to honor your father and mother. That's the first one dealing with our relations with our fellow man. If you dishonor your father and mother, you're sinning. Thou shalt not murder. Murder is sin. Adultery comes next. It's sin. All these other things. That tells you what sin is. And you've got to think that through and understand that. We're telling you about that more and more on this program and in the various booklets and the literature that we offer you absolutely free. But you need to learn what sin is. After real repentance from sin, did you abhor yourself, you promised to quit sinning, quit disobeying God's law, and you're baptized, then God promises you the Holy Spirit. And of course, when you're baptized, that means you go down into a watery grave. You're picturing the death of the old self. 
The old self, the old you is to be dead and buried under the water. Think about it. It's to be dead and buried. And then you come up to walk in newness of life. And then God gives you the Holy Spirit to help you walk that new life. And the Holy Spirit gives you God's love and His very character. That Holy Spirit is promised to you. He said, Repent and be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice back in Romans 5 and verse 5. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God, not human love, not hippie love or something like that, but the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given us. The Holy Spirit gives us the very love of God. What is that love, and how does that love operate? Let's turn back to 1 John again, the first epistle of John, and chapter 5. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His, God's, commandments. Not some new commandments of Jesus, although we should keep those too. They're simply just magnifying God's commandments when we read them carefully. But we're to keep the commandments of God. So we love our neighbor. We love God when we do that. For this is the love of God. Here now explains it. What love is shed abroad through the Holy Spirit? This is the love of God that we keep His commandments, God's commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome, or as the King James says, are not grievous. The Ten Commandments are not hard and stiff and difficult like people make them out to be. Many preachers will tell you, oh, you can't keep those commandments. That's the spiritual law, and you're not able to keep it. Well, it's true. You can't keep it perfectly up and by yourself, but Christ in you can keep it. And as I've explained too often, Christ has to live in us through His Holy Spirit. Back in Joplin High School, I was going this way. I walked this way like all my friends. I did what I wanted to do. And I was selfish and vain and carnal and so forth, fighting and cheating and doing things that were bad. I went that way regularly. I wasn't the worst guy in class, but I was normal. Normal kid growing up in America. I was going that way. After I repented, I started going this way, a different way. You say, well, you don't do that perfectly. No, I don't. I slip off the path once in a while. I do. And I get some mud on my knees, but I get back up on the path, on the path going a different direction. And with the God of Spirit and the Spirit of God in me, I can change. I can grow. I have that outside help, the promise of the Holy Spirit. So you've got to believe in that promise and realize that the Holy Spirit flows down the riverbed of keeping the Ten Commandments. This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. They're not too hard to keep. Is it too difficult to keep from strangling your grandmother? Is it too difficult to keep from murdering, from committing adultery, from lying and cheating and stealing? It shouldn't be, but with God's help, you can stop it and you can do the right thing and have the opposite, which is love and outflowing concern for others and worship and adoration for God through the Holy Spirit within you. Then you can be a real Christian. Notice again back in Romans, if you turn back there with me, let's turn to Romans chapter 6 this time. The Apostle Paul tells us this about baptism. Romans 6 and verse 3 Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried. Notice, when we're baptized, we're buried with Him in baptism. It's a symbol of burial. And, of course, many thousands of sailors have been buried at sea. They lower their caskets right down in the water. That is their watery grave. And when you're really baptized in real baptism, adult baptism, after counting the cost, After real heartfelt repentance, it is the burial of the old self. We were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, a completely different life through the help of Christ in us. Let's turn to Galatians 2.20 this time. I'm going to just quote this to you because it is my favorite scripture, perhaps, in all the Bible, certainly in the New Testament. Galatians 2 and verse 20. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The the Jesus Christ, the real Christ, who's sitting at God's right hand through the Holy Spirit, lives His life in us through the Holy Spirit. Christ lives in me, Paul said, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live through the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. We live by Christ's faith. 
Christ lives in us. Through Christ in us, we'll keep the Ten Commandments. Through Christ in us, we'll keep holy the same day as Christ kept holy. Through Christ in us, we'll worship God the same way Christ did. Through Christ in us, we will love and serve one another and have total outflowing concern for a fellow man, and we will have worship and adoration for God, and we'll obey God, love God, know that God's way is right, and be willing to do what God says. This is what real Christianity is all about. You need God's precious Holy Spirit to become a true Christian. You need Christ within you to become a true Christian. So as an adult, you need to count the cost, and you need to be buried in baptism to be a true Christian. Think about it. Pray about it. Meditate about it. Again, write or call right away. Call now to receive your copy of our vital booklet, an extremely helpful booklet, spelling things out, not just an emotional appeal at all, but an explanation more thorough than I can give here. Call today for our booklet, Should You Be Baptized? This booklet will explain thoroughly from the Bible the real meaning of water baptism. Yet we'll send you this booklet absolutely free upon your request. No cost, no obligation, no one will call. So you call us right now before you forget it and request your free copy of our helpful booklet, Should You Be Baptized? This informative booklet is yours absolutely free. No cost, no obligation. If you call this toll-free number, 1-800-934-5579. That's 1-800-934-5579. Or send your request to Tomorrow's World. P.O. Box 501304, San Diego, California, 92150. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. No cost, no obligation to you. Call today. Be sure to tune in every week, my friends, at this same time to Tomorrow's World program. Richard Ames and I will open your eyes to prophetic events that are about to happen and biblical truths you may never have understood. So take time each week to tune in. We'll see you right here next week. The informative booklet offered on this program is yours absolutely free if you call 1-800-934-5579 or send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 501304, San Diego, California, 92150. Be sure to visit our webpage at www.tomorrowsworld.org. That address again is www.tomorrowsworld.org. The preceding program was produced by the Living Church of God.